Bien, pues muchas gracias. Espero que hayan disfrutado el, este pequeño receso con un poco de café y un poco de galletas. Y para continuar con el siguiente segmento de esta mañana, eh, tenemos al doctor James McNeat de, de la NOA, en donde va a presentarnos el tema de introducción a, al GOES R y resumen y beneficios del GOES R, instrumentos y nuevos productos. Eh, inmediatamente después de esta presentación, tenemos la comida aquí a unos cuantos metros en la cafetería de la Facultad de Veterinaria, en donde por supuesto está cubierta por, por, por los organizadores. Entonces, con Jesús Romero, que levánteme la mano por ahí, Jesús, eh, van, van a pasar para que les dé su boletito, y ese boletito lo canjean eh, directamente en cafetería para que puedan comer, y tenemos una sección especial para los participantes de este taller, de tener un, una zona este, especial, y además también Jesús les va a dar un obsequio que nuestros amigos de la NOA nos trajeron para, para todos ustedes. Muchas gracias, sin más preámbulo, demos de la bienvenida al doctor Magni. Gracias. Uh, good morning, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here in Mexico City. Uh, I've already enjoyed the food here and the people. I uh, got a chance to walk around yesterday, and it's a beautiful city. And thank you for having us here. My uh, NOAA colleagues here with me uh, include Martin, who you've met, Natalia, Scott, and uh, Paul Seymour. And so you'll get a chance to, uh, to hear them as they give their presentations uh, as well. And uh, Scott, of course, is going to present the uh, ABI and GOM lessons. So uh, the slides I have that pertain to ABI, they're just to get you started, and then he'll carry through with a lot of great information. I heard him do this in Canada at a presentation given up there, and he's outstanding. So I know you're going to enjoy this a lot. Uh, I want to thank my, uh, my colleagues who uh, helped me put this together. Um, both in NOAA and, uh, and here, Gabriela was a big help. She looked at my slides, and Martin translated these slides for you, so make sure you thank him when you see him during lunch for doing all this work. You can, you'll be able to tell it was a lot of work. So the, the plan today is uh, for me to take an hour to talk about our constellation. Martin talked about the GOES, and I'll, I'll talk about our current constellation, provide you an overview of the GOES-R series, and talk about the benefits of the GOES-R series satellites. I'll describe the instruments and provide you a list of products, which Gabriella did a good job uh, listing those as well, and you'll hear more about the products during this workshop and provide a little bit of information on how we do our product validation and uh, talk about the different uh, maturity levels of the products for GO-16 and what we're doing now with GO-17. And just give you a little bit of information on GOES-T and GOES-U, which will be, GOES-T will be the next satellite to launch. And thanks to my colleague in the GOES-R program, uh, product readiness and operations team. The product readiness and operations team is called the Pro Team. And Catherine Moser put together these slides just for you on the International Advanced Baseline Imager Mesoscale Domain Sector Request Procedures. This is a way that users can request the mesoscale of the smallest, uh, highest resolution uh, products. So as mentioned earlier today, the geostationary uh, operational environmental satellites are placed into a ge geosynchronous orbit, which is an orbit that keeps the satellite over a specific location on the Earth, in this case, in the equatorial plane. And by maintaining a position hovering over a fixed point on the Earth's surface, the GO satellites are able to constantly monitor atmospheric conditions in a particular portion of the atmosphere. And the latest generation that goes R is the United States' most advanced fleet of geostationary weather satellites. It significantly improves the detection and the observation of environmental phenomena that directly affect public safety and protection of property. And the great thing about being in this workshop is you'll actually learn how to do that using the imagery from uh, goes R satellites. The satellites provide advanced imaging with increased spatial resolution 
and faster coverage for more accurate forecasts, real-time mapping of lightning activity, and improved monitoring of solar activity and space weather. We have four satellites in the series. GOES-R was renamed GOES-16 when it reached the geostationary orbit. It was launched as GOES-R on November 19, 2016. Uh, Martin had mentioned that we had had weather impacts prior to the launch. We also had, during the actual launch, delays on the range uh, and other delays that caused the satellite to be launched in the very last minute of its launch window, the period of time during which we could launch. GOES-S, uh, renamed GOES-17 when it reached its geostationary orbit, was launched on March 1st of this year in the very first minute of the launch window. So it was very successful and uh, not as anxious for us as goes are. Now, I work in the satellite and product operations, uh, as, do, um, as does Natalia and, and Paul Seymour uh, supports this as well. And the pictures you see there are of the NOAA satellite operations facility located in Suitland, Maryland, which is near Washington, DC. And that's our operational center where we perform the command and control of the United States operational weather satellites. And Martin had a slide that showed 18 satellites being operated uh, continuously around the clock by the people in the room in the picture uh, right here. And this space was actually just recently totally refurbished, refurbished and uh, it's a very effective use of space in there right now. Each satellite that we operate has its own space. Uh, it goes ours right in here. Uh, there's imagery and data that can be displayed on the large screens. There's also uh, people in the back that man staff our environmental satellite processing center help desk. So if a user has a problem, they can call the help desk and report it to that 24-7 help desk. And those people can actually just walk right over to the operator and ask a question. So that's a very effective way of getting uh, information. Okay. So our current constellation has the GOES-16 satellite operating as GOES East at 75.2 West. Now it replaced GOES-13, which was moved to 60 West and put into storage. Now I'm gonna mention this now because this question might come up later with GOES-17. With GOES-16, we actually had a short period of time, th about three weeks, where we uh, operated goes 13 at its east position um, and also operated goes 16. We call that concurrent operations. However, in order to transmit the direct broadcast from goes 13, we had to relay the uh, information from goes 13 through goes 14. So prior to goes east, goes 16 taking the goes east position, users could receive the direct broadcast from a service called GVAR, goes variable. During this period of concurrent operations, they could receive the GVAR by pointing to 105, getting it off the GOES-14, but it was actually GOES-13 data. And we did that just for a short period of time. We were limited in our resources and how long we can do that. After we were done with that, then um, GOES-13 was moved to 60 West. When GOES-S was launched, it became GOES-17 when it reached its geostationary orbit. It was um, then moved to 89.5 west, which is the checkout position where we do our post-launch testing and check out the satellite. So we, uh, we ha always have a standby satellite and that continues to be GOES-17. So if we needed to use uh, a legacy satellite, for example, if there was an issue with GOES-16, we would use GOES-14 
We could operate it from 105, or we could move it if we had to. Now, currently, the GOES West satellite is the GOES 15, which is the previous generation of satellites. And it operates at 135. So I'll talk about GOES 17 later, but the designated position for GOES 17 uh, as in the, um, is 137. So it's a little bit different than the GOES 15 position. Okay. So we have the satellites. We have the, the GOES 16 operating as GOES East at 75.2. That's our operational GOES East satellite. We have GOES 17 that's being checked out at 89.5 degrees west. Where does the data go? Well, the, the data is downloaded to our command and data acquisition station at Wallops. And that's located uh, in the state of Virginia on the Chesapeake Bay, uh, not too far from the Atlantic Ocean and uh, at a NASA facility. And that's where our antennas are to receive the raw data from the satellite. If we uh, had a problem there, or for any other reasons, we could use our backup facility, which is in the state of uh, West Virginia. We call that a consolidated backup. That's a backup for JPSS as well. So this gets a little complicated, so I'm actually going to defer explaining a lot of this until my next presentation, which is on data access. So on this, I'll make a couple of points that are important. Uh, the arrows represent data flow. So as I mentioned, the raw data from the instruments, the instrument data is coming down to the Wallops Command and Data Acquisition Station. That raw data is processed. There's actually ground system software associated with the GOES-R series. And that ground system software is installed in, at three places, at Wallops, at the NOAA Satellite Operations Facility, and also at the Consolidated Backup. The primary flow is the instrument data down to Wallops, where the raw data, what we call level zero data, is processed into level 1B. B is in Bravo. Those products then are transmitted back up to the satellite for relay on the GRB transponder and antenna down to direct broadcast users. And interestingly, NOAA uses the GRB antenna to receive that data as well. So the GRB is very important. It's our, the GOES rebroadcast is the primary relay of the GOES R-series data. We have other direct broadcasts as well that we'll talk about, the high-rate information transfer, emergency managers, weather, information network. The high-rate information transfer, emergency managers, weather information network is uh, a uh, 400 kilobits per second feed. So uh, compared to the GRB, which is GRB is 30 megabits per second, uh, there's less information on that feed. And we'll talk about that as well. Okay, this is uh, where it gets complicated. <laughs> so the, the key points, in addition to what I've talked about already, are that when the uh, NOAA Satellite Operations Facility receives the processed data on the GRB feed, downlink, technically it's a downlink, then it's ingested by the ground system software and provided to the um, PDA, which is the, the product distribution access point. So these products are then distributed to archive at class, which I'll, I'll describe that later, but that's basically our national archive for environmental satellite data. 
And in addition to transferring what's already been created in the way of products, the ground software also generates the level two products. And these are uh, products that require additional processing and they are displaying additional parameters other than the radiances that are in the level 1B for the imager. We have other distribution mechanisms as well, most notably to the uh, National Weather Service, which as Martin said, is our primary operational customer within the United States. So we provide uh, cloud and moisture imagery uh, two ways to the National Weather Service. We create cloud and moisture imagery products and wallops and provide them in a dedicated point-to-point uh, -point transfer communications. And then we provide it to their um, auto automated weather interactive processing system, which is the computer system they use in the forecast offices. The National Weather Service forecasters sit at these workstations and uh, they receive data from a broadcast as well. So I think that's all I'll cover right now. Um, but we have a number of users um, who are operational users like meteorological services who are um, able to access uh, data through the PDA. And then we have a good number that access data through the GRB. And then we have uh, a large number of uh, HRET M1 users as well. So we'll talk about that in the next lesson. So the, the, the instruments on the GOES-R series are the Advanced Baseline Imager, the ge Geostationary Lightning Mapper, the Solar Ultraviolet Imager, the Extreme Ultraviolet and X-ray Irradiance Sensors, the Space Environment in situ Suite, and the Magnetometer. The GOES rebroadcast that 30 mega, 31 megabits per second downlink has products from all six of these instruments. And you can see in this picture how they're, uh, how they're mounted. We have the, uh, the EXIS, the Extreme Ultraviolet and X-ray Irradiance Sensor, and the SUVI mounted up by the solar array. I'll talk about that a little bit more. We also, in addition to the instruments, we have, uh, we have unique payload services, which is just a fancy way of talking about our communication services. So we have the GRB, we have the HRIT MWIN that I mentioned, and the data collection system, and the search and rescue satellite aided tracking SARSAT system. I just want to mention that the data collection system is a relay of data collection platforms, they're called, on the ground. So data collection platforms are connected to meteorological and hydrological instruments. They measure the weather, water levels, and other important criteria. And that information, that data, is transmitted up to the geostationary satellites, which are used as a communications relay down to wallops. So it's a large number of platforms, weather stations and water level um, measurement systems, uh, 29,000. And there's 6 million observations a, a day that are transmitted through DCS. We have three categories in regards to the way the instruments are mounted on the spacecraft. And the nadir pointing are the earth pointed uh, sensors. They're at the, the platform, the nadir pointing platform, or I'll call it the earth pointing platform, is highly stable. It's precision pointed. It's dynamically isolated from the rest of the spacecraft to cut down and minimize vibrations. So you don't want the imager to shake, so it's isolated, so there won't be any shaking of the instruments when other things move on the spacecraft. So that would be the advanced baseline imager and the geostationary lightning mapper. Those are the two 
instruments looking down on the Earth. The solar pointing, or the platform mounts the instruments that point towards the sun. It utilizes a sun pointing platform housed on the solar array yoke, the bottom part of the solar array, that provides a stable platform that tracks the seasonal and daily movement of the sun relative to the spacecraft. So the solar pointing platform supports the Exus, the SUVI, and the unique payload services, the communications. The third category are the in situ instruments. The in situ platform features include a wide variance in the field of view for the size sensors. And it has a boom to provide relative magnetic isolation for the magnetometer, that big, that boom. And uh, if you go to the GOES-R website, you'll see, you can see a video of this deploying uh, in the laboratory. It's really pretty interesting. All this information that I'm showing today is on the GOES-R website on the internet. So now I'll describe each instrument. Let's see. Sorry about that, hit the wrong button. Okay. The advanced baseline imager provides about 65% of all the products that are generated on the spacecraft. It is a multi-channel passive imaging radiometer designed to observe the Western Hemisphere and provide variable area imagery and radiometric information of the Earth's surface, atmosphere, and cloud cover. It provides scans uh, in three types of scans, a full disk, um, the continental United States, and the mesoscale. So that's the, that's the uh, way I think of it. The full disk would be the full hemisphere coverage. The continental U.S. is 5,000 kilometers by 3,000 kilometers, and the meso scale is 1,000 kilometer by 1,000 kilometers. Now I'll read what I have on the slide here. The full disk is hemispheric coverage of 83 degree local zenith angle, temporal resolution of 5 to 15 minutes, and spatial resolution of 0.5 to 2 kilometers. The MESO scale provides coverage over a 1,000 kilometer by 1,000 kilometer box with a temporal resolution of 30 seconds. And that's if they put, there are two boxes available. If they put one box over the other, then it would be 30 seconds. But most typically we have two boxes, one over one area and the other MESO scale over another area. So the resolution would be every, um, every minute. And the, the sp spatial resolution is 0.5 kilometer to 2 kilometer, as it is with all the scans. Uh, the different bands uh, have different resolutions. And band 2 that we'll talk about is band 2 of the ABI is a 0.5 kilometer resolution. And the Continental United States scan is performed every five minutes, providing coverage of 5,000 kilometers by 3,000 kilometers. It's a rectangle over the United States. And the spatial resolution, again, 0.5 to 2 kilometers. So we have uh, three modes in which we can provide those scans. Uh, mode four would be a full disk every five minutes. Most common mode right now is mode three. That's called the flex mode. And that provides a full disk scan every 15 minutes, a conus every five minutes, and two meso scale every 60 seconds or if they put them on top of each other, it would be every 30 seconds. We're looking at a new mode six that we'll be testing out on GOES 17. And mode six would be similar to mode three. Um, the only change between mode six and mode three would be that a full disk scan will be provided every 10 minutes. But the conus and the meso scale will be the same as mode three. Now, this geostationary lightning mapper, you, you've, uh, Scott's going to provide a lesson on the GLM, so you'll have more information on the products. 
The uh, instrument itself is a single channel near infrared optical transient detector that can detect the momentary changes in an optical scene indicating the presence of lightning. And GOM measures total lightning in cloud plus cloud to cloud plus cloud to ground. And it measures that activity continuously over the Americas and the adjacent ocean regions with near uniform spatial resolution of approximately 10 kilometers. Contractor is Lockheed Martin. Uh, the characteristics are listed on the slide. <coughs> and so I, I, won't, uh, I, won't, I won't read this, but you can read the uh, characteristics here. The solar ultraviolet imager is the next instrument that I'll talk about. It's a telescope that monitors the sun in the extreme ultraviolet wavelength range, and it compiles full disk solar images around the clock. SUVI replaces the GOES solar X-ray imager that was on the, uh, the legacy satellites, the GOES 13, GOES 15, and 14. And it represents a change in both spectral coverage and spatial resolution, an improvement. Uh, SUVI uh, locates uh, coronal holes for geometric storm forecasts, detects and locate flares for forecasts of solar energetic particle events related to flares, monitors changes in the corona that indicate coronal mass ejections that can interfere with uh, communications and detects active regions beyond the east limb for activity forecasts, analyzes the active region complexity for flare forecasts. Contractor is Lockheed Martin. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Thought I had a movie in there, but it looks like it's not in there. Okay. Right, the uh, extreme ultraviolet and X-ray irradiance sensors is critical to understanding and monitoring solar irradiance in the upper atmosphere. The power and effect of the sun's electromagnetic radiation per unit of area. Onboard Exus are two main sensors, the extreme ultraviolet sensor and the X-ray sensor, which help scientists monitor activity on the sun. Exus resides on the sun pointing platform on the satellite mounted on the yoke of the solar array. And the contractor is a laboratory for atmospheric and space physics in Boulder. The next instrument is the SICE, the space environment in situ suite, which is comprised of four sensors that monitor proton, electron, and heavy ion fluxes in the magnetosphere. The information provided by SICE is critical for assessing the electrostatic discharge risk and radiation hazard to astronauts and satellites. In addition to hazard assessment, the information from SICE can be used to warn of high flux events mitigating any damage to radio communication. The SICE instrument suite consists of the energetic heavy ion sensor, the, the magnetic spheric particle sensors, both high and low, and solar and galactic proton sensor. The SICE data drive solar radiation storm portion of the NOAA space weather scales and other alerts and warnings and improve energetic particle forecasts. The contractor is the Assurance Technology Corporation. So uh, the mag magnetometer, the mag, provides measurements of the space environment magnetic field that controls charged particle dynamics in the outer region of the magnetosphere. These particles can be dangerous to spacecraft and human spaceflight. The geomagnetic field measurements are important for providing alerts and warnings to many customers, including satellite operators and power utilities.
MAG products are an integral part of NOAA space weather operations, providing information on the general level of geomagnetic activity and permitting detection of sudden magnetic storms. In addition, measurements can be used to validate large-scale space environment models that are used in operations. And the contractor is Lockheed Martin. What I'd like to do now is talk about the product generation and have you think about that uh, slide that I showed with the instrument data coming down to wallops. So that uh, is the same as this uh, line here where the raw data packets come down to wallops. And I'm going to walk you through how the products are generated from level zero, which is the raw data from the instruments, uh, to level 1B, which is what we get on the GRB. So we have six instruments on the satellite. Five of the instruments have level 1B products on the GRB downlink, and the GOM, the sixth instrument, the GOM has level 2 products. So once the, the data is received at Wallops, Virginia, then the ground station software processes it and provides level 1B products, which are then uplinked back to the satellite for relay on the GOES rebroadcast transponder. The GOES rebroadcast transponder transmits on its antenna those same products down to the NOAA satellite, satellite operations facility direct broadcast users, including the National Center for Environmental Prediction Centers, and the other national, the, there, are five, there are five national centers within the United States National Weather Service that have these antennas like the one here, and separate software, but the same type of setup. Separate hardware as well, but same idea. They're receiving the data directly, just like they do here, and then creating uh, products. So the details of that, of how the product is generated, are now on the rest of this slide. So we have 100 megabits per second of data coming down as level zero data and associated science telemetry data. And then that data is compressed as well. So it's, it's decompressed. And, um, and then we have to then um, calibrate the uh, detector, the ABI detector values in order to uh, determine the radiances and to navigate the radiances into the Earth's location. After the um, radiance values are navigated in Earth's location, then we determine the uh, resample into the fixed grid, at that point we have um, geolocated the data. The ABI fixed grid is an ellipsoid uh, reference projection that we use so that every uh, data point would have the same map to the same radiance value uh, independent of the product processing. So there's more information on that in the documentation that we have on the Gozar website. So this is an image that was taken in January of uh, 2017 for GO-16, the first image, and uh, also some of the space weather plots associated with it as well. And you can see uh, the increase in spatial resolution that we are getting with the ABI. And again, this is Hurricane Franklin, so another good image. You can see um, a lot of the features there in the eye wall and the, and the convection. And uh, in addition to this, we have the, geo, the geostationary lightning mapper, the GOM, so we have lightning data that helps us uh, determine the convective initiation as well. So this is something that we've never had before, a combination of these. 
You can see here in this picture uh, in northern Mexico, you can see, oops, you can see the, uh, the smoke plumes from fires as well as the uh, afternoon thunderstorms, which probably at convection probably had a lot to do with this, these, uh, the smoke being produced here. And uh, now I'll talk about the, uh, the products and their what we call maturity level. So as uh, products, as the instruments are calibrated and the algorithms are calibrated, the uh, products themselves move through uh, three tiers of a maturity uh, model. So there's three maturity levels and the beta validation is the first one and that's done at a review it's uh, we call it a peer stakeholder product validation review, and you'll see that again in a slide. So we get the uh, experts together, and they make a decision as to whether the products um, are uh, been tested enough to be made available for uh, testing. That testing is very uh, minimal. It's just a minimal validation to make sure there aren't any serious errors with it. Uh, it's, at the beta level, it's not optimized for operational use, not to be used uh, uh, for uh, operations. And uh, it's primarily for people to test their systems out, and it's the first time that that product will be on the GOES rebroadcast, will be at beta. The provisional validation involves much more testing, although not as, as much as required to optimize for operational use, but at this point, the product performance has been demonstrated through analysis of a small number of independent measurements, uh, but not a full year's worth. So just a uh, you know, period of time, you'll see it on the schedule. But the product analysis is sufficient to communicate product performance, and we do that in readme files. Now, so there's a document that you can access uh, on the internet, and it'll tell you what is not um, tell you what you need to be aware of at the provisional level. There's some things that are still being worked on usually. At full validation, the product's been tested for usually, uh, some products have to be tested for a whole season. Obviously, the hurricane intensity product has to be tested during a hurricane season. So full validation could take a while. And this is what it looks like on the schedule. So this is the... Uh, the post-launch science product validation schedule for GO16, it shows a lot of activity that's been done. We uh, provide this uh, to our GRB users through the GRB user group, which I chair, and Gabrielle is on it. So you can see uh, listed across the top is the timeline, the initial launch and orbit raising period, and then the post-launch test period which was completed for GOES-16. And then once GOES-16 became the operational GOES-E satellite, we went into extended validation, continued validation. You can see there's still more validation going on. And, um, and then in the to operations. So what, the way these stars work is that the uh, light blue is the beta peer stakeholder product validation review. And that's the first time that the data will show up on the uh, GRB. So, um, so SICE was first, and then we had our ABI level 1B, uh, and then other products followed as well on the GRB. And uh, we, we actually work with our GRB users. They participate in this testing. So, for example, University of Wisconsin, where Scott works, they have uh, been very, very helpful because they evaluate the products and provide us feedback during this test period. And we actually have made changes to the ground system software based on that feedback. So we've, we've actually d written work requests, they're called, and then had changes made based on our users' feedback during the test period. So you can see uh, we had a period here where we did not transmit on the GRB when we uh, moved from the checkout position to the goes east position. That will be the same with goes 17. We will not transmit. Um, as we move the satellite because of X-band interference with other X-band receive stations. 
And, and then we've continued with the, uh, with, as you can see, with the provisional testing and the full validation testing uh, for the products, even after it went operational. Well, Gabriella did a good job with this. She showed you these baseline products, uh, both for the uh, ABI, and in the next page I have the other instruments. I wanted to just uh, make one point, and that is, of all these products, the cloud and moisture imagery is what we call a key performance parameter. That's tied to the mission success of, of the uh, mission. So for, for Gozar to be successful, we have to meet our specifications for creating and distributing these products. So if other products, we're having problems, we're having a lot of problems, the highest priority is gonna be the cloud moisture imagery product, primarily uh, to the National Weather Service. We have uh, other products as well. So these, these are the baseline products of the other instruments. And again, the Gozar website is great to learn more about these products. We have a lot of information available. You can read documents that provide information about the actual algorithms and how these products are generated. Okay. Look, GOES-17, uh, as I mentioned, is a very successful launch as GOES-S in uh, March 1st. Uh, launched Cape Canaveral in Florida uh, during the day. GO-16 was launched at night, so this was a kind of a different experience, but um, very exciting. I want to mention, uh, many of you have heard about this already, but when we started checking out the satellite, we noticed a problem with the uh, ABI on GO-17. So on GO-17, we're currently addressing a performance issue with the cooling system that was encountered uh, during commissioning and, uh, and post-launch test. And we have uh, uh, many teams working on this right now. Uh, the problem is that the cooling system is not working as it should, and the ABI has to be cooled. Um, certain, certain times during the 24-hour day, the uh, instrument itself will heat up and generate uh, its own uh, heat, and that is picked up by the sensor, and so uh, the sensor is saturated in the IR bands. So 13 of the IR channels are affected by varying degrees uh, the, the, uh, in the near IR channels. The longest wavelength channels are affected the most. Uh, we have teams of experts from NOAA, NASA, and uh, industry, and the ABI contractor team working on this. We have a team working on investigating the anomaly and understanding what caused it, and, and because we need to know for the next satellite, uh, we need to know for GOES-T. Uh, we've already assembled GOES-T. We'll have to take it apart and fix whatever we have to fix with the ABI, depending on what the anomaly team finds. We also, also have a science team looking at what we can do uh, with GOES-17. We have uh, five instruments working anomaly. We have uh, three bands on the ABI out of 16 working anomaly. So, you know, the visible uh, channels and near IR working anomaly, and we're, and we're getting some great imagery from it. Um, and we can use the other channels during certain times of the day. So it's only certain hours during the day where we've got this, this uh, degradation. So we have teams looking at that. Um, and we can create products uh, using additional data too. So uh, we're looking at that too from other satellites. So there's a lot of work going on with this right now. And as we get more information, we'll be providing that to the public. In fact, I think we might get some more information this week. So uh, if that information is released, then we'll pass that on to you. We'll be watching our website for an update. Okay. Time here. So the, the first public images were released after the orbit raising. We released the ABI public image at the end of May. Uh, at the 
the beginning of the, the product distribution, the initial products that are be released will be released on the GRB as beta, so they won't be available to, um, uh, to the public. Um, the product distribution and access point uh, in Maryland and the uh, National Weather Service Advanced Weather Interactive Processing System, uh, though data will be flowing through there, but only for the uh, CalVal teams, people that are working on the calibration and validation. So not, not to other users yet. Um, and the, uh, the, the HRIT, MWIN, and the GeoNetCast <coughs> won't distribute it at beta yet either. So uh, completion of external product distribution will happen uh, uh, at provisional, and that's when the additional products are put on the PDA and distributed um, for other than the CalVal team users. And this, uh, I'm not gonna go through all this right now because I'll do this in my next presentation, but the idea here is that if you look at this chart, for example, um, and you look at uh, GOES rebroadcast, you'll see that um, beta will be put on the GRB, uh, but not the pre-beta. So there's no information flowing in GRB until beta. And the PDA users, the only one that get pre-beta and beta <laughs> products are the calibration validation teams, because they need that in order to uh, prepare for the reviews. After the provisional review, what we call the peer stakeholder product validation review, then um, after the provisional review, then other PDA users will get the products. And the same idea applies to CLASS, which is our national archive. Researchers can go to CLASS. Uh, anybody that has a non-real-time requirement for data can go to CLASS. Anybody can go to CLASS. The data there is not available as fast as it is available through the PDA. So obviously we're sensitive about what information, uh, uh, what imagery is released because we, we're continuously working on the imagery. So it's really important that the imagery is labeled properly, especially um, for operators. So the public releases have occurred for MAG, SICE, GOM, EXIS, SUVI, and for ABI, only the shortwave bands. <clears throat> so, um, we publicly released ABI data from the three shortwave visible and near IR bands only, and therefore only imagery created from ABI bands one, two, and three should be shared until NOAA officially issues the first image, infrared imagery, and that's not widely shared either. Um, before provisional, but after the first image release, the, uh, the imagery needs to be labeled appropriately, that is preliminary and not for operational data and the data uh, are not shared. When the data is provisional, then uh, data can be uh, shared. Data is not necessarily operational because the satellite's not in its operational position. So we still have to use the caveats. So I hope that makes sense. You know, we can use the imagery, but until the satellite actually becomes the operational satellite, like for example, in the GO-16 became the GOES east operational satellite, then we stopped putting the markings on the imagery. So I'm gonna skip these slides because I'll talk about these in the, my next uh, presentation. And I, I've kind of talked about this already. So we'll skip these. These, these. these slides just give you more information as to when information's uh, available. So this is the, uh, oops, this is the uh, GO-17 post-launch science product validation schedule. This shows uh, with ABI that we did have a first image, uh, first light image release May 31st. Uh, but we don't know when we're going to have our beta release because we're still working through these, uh, these issues. Um, we uh, are still marching towards uh, our schedule, though, of uh, NOAA taking over operations of the satellite in the fall, so we're still working towards that. Um, and 
On the uh, GOM, we've also had our uh, first release, and we've released uh, products for the other instruments uh, as well. The first uh, instrument that actually provides science data on the GOES rebroadcast is the EXIS. And we are in our post-launch test period for EXIS now. And that uh, PSPBR, the, po the uh, peer stakeholder product validation review, is held June 27th. And our uh, GRB users are working with us during this test period. We have a number of users who are working with us during the post-launch test. Again, you can see where the, uh, the provisional PSPVRs are scheduled and then the full validation um, tentatively in September 2019. I mentioned mode six before. Mode six, right now we have mode four and mode three, and mode three is the most commonly used mode for the ABI. Uh, mode six is like mode three, but with the 10 minute uh, full disk image interval. Uh, the rest is the same. And we'll determine uh, uh, together with the National Weather Service what, what uh, Mode 6 uh, future will be. The idea is, though, that if the Weather Service wants to use Mode 6, that could, that could be the, the primary mode rather than Mode 3. Um, but we just have to, to look at that, and it depends a lot on our GO-17 performance. Uh, GOES-T, as I, as I uh, mentioned, planned for 2020. Uh, all instruments are integrated with the spacecraft, although we might have to take the ABI out, uh, depending on what we find with ABI on GOES-17. Uh, the antenna wing assembly is installed. All pre-environmental comprehensive performance tests are completed. The spacecraft is ready for pre-environmental review pending resolution of the ABI cooling system anomaly. Uh, GOES-U planned for 2024. System module integration underway, and the core propulsion module integration is underway. So what's really important is how to get more information. So if you have questions, uh, you can uh, contact us. We have a user services group within the Office of Satellite and Product Operations. They're very responsive. <coughs> and um, we have our 24-7 help desk. We also have a direct services uh, email there and, um, and websites where you can get more information. And my email is there as well. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions about the GRB. I've mentioned that it goes our website a lot. That's the link there for that. Oops, sorry about that. All right, sorry about that. So those are all the links. And then my email, and we also have a survey where we're uh, soliciting information from uh, direct broadcast users on that website there. Okay. What I'd like to talk about now, Catherine Moser put these slides together for me. And uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is really, uh, to me, this is really neat. This is really uh, a great opportunity that we provide to international users where international users, prim primary meteorological services, um, satellite operating agencies can request uh, mesoscale scale domains. We, we do this internally. Great, thank you. We do this internally with the Weather Service. We have a, a procedure worked out that's been working very well um, where the National Weather Service forecast offices can request these uh, domains. So the, the GOES-R series uh, flex mode currently, the mode three, the, the mode three is the full disk every 15 minutes, the CONUS every five, and the mesoscale every uh, 30. And um, the mesoscale domain sector coverage is 1,000 kilometer by 1,000 kilometer. And so they have, these boxes have default locations where they are if there's not a request. And if they're not in the default right now, it's probably because the National Weather Service requested an assignment. Okay. So we will, re, uh, we will honor requests, international requests, on a best effort-based um, 
on the, on the uh, other requests that we get from the National Weather Service. And we have a prioritizing scheme that we use to prioritize, prioritize requests as well, based on the type of event that is being requested for. Obviously, severe weather, um, public health and uh, safety, they take priority over uh, other types of requests. So we need those requests in English. Uh, what we need in the request is which satellite, is it the east um, or the west? And this is uh, based on uh, GO-16 is east, and if GO-17 is goes west, and that, that's what this is assuming. And then, um, and, and then what is the center point of the area in decimal degrees? The start date and time, the end date and time, the requesting organization, and the reason uh, or the phenomena that you're trying to cover with the mesoscale domain. And this is very important for prioritizing the request. We're requesting that uh, there only be one requesting entity per country, and um, we'd like to have that person identified or that organization identified ahead of time. And uh, that'll be coordinated through the satellite analysis branch in, within my office, the Office of Satellite and Product Operations. And uh, phone numbers listed there. Our uh, user service coordinator will uh, process the requests. Uh, you can submit it online through a, a Google form as well. And, uh, and on this uh, website, you can uh, click the link and, and that will actually get you right to the request form. And so you have this in the slides that's available to you. Please make the request at least 10 days in advance. Uh, it can be made much earlier. Requests will be honored on a best effort basis. And a user services coordinator from the Office of Satellite and Product Operations will contact you during regular business hours to coordinate the request. And so there's this, this is the link where you can actually look at where the current and planned MDSs are, missile scale domain sectors. You can see where we're planning on putting the missile scale boxes. Uh, emails will be sent by the NESDIS Environmental Satellite Processing Center. That's the help desk I mentioned earlier. You can subscribe by sending an email to the ESP operations at NOAA.gov. Anybody can, can receive these. It'll, uh, we put a lot of information out, operational type information um, on the status of the satellites and changes and also product outages. And uh, notifications will be archived as well. So I encourage you, if you have any specific uh, questions, you can ask me uh, during the conference, but certainly Catherine Moser is our point of contact, and she'd be happy to uh, answer any questions that you have. And Catherine's email is there, and she's in user services. Uh, very importantly for my presentations are the uh, acronyms. So in the presentation, which you'll have, I have all the uh, acronyms. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Do you, uh, do you want to take uh, one or two questions? Or? Ah, eh, sí. Si alguien quisiera tener alguna pregunta inmediatamente, tenemos unos cinco minutos más. Podríamos directamente hacerla aquí con James. Entonces yo pasaría con el micrófono. Veo algún interés en realizar una pregunta en este momento. Buenas tardes. Eh, mi duda es en cuestión de los rayos del sensor. Si se pueden generar archivos que se puedan montar a un sistema como Argis. No 
interesting. Okay, for my uh, colleagues, uh, English-speaking colleagues, the question was whether the imagery products can be put into an ArcGIS uh, commercial GIS system. Um, so the, the answer is that the uh, products are a net CDF format. Yeah. Data. Just right. Make it yeah. it right. So, so you could use a, you could use an open source or a commercial tool to make a geotiff. Uh, also, the uh, ellipsoid projection is based on GRS eighty. So, um, there there are people that I'm sure that can work on transitioning that into other uh, GIS projections. But the, as Scott said, the easiest way would to make a geotiff. Is that helpful? Okay. Mm -hmm. Gabby has more too. Yeah. Well, de, respecto a los datos que estamos recibiendo eh, este, aquí en, eh, directamente en el ANOT, toda la información que nosotros estamos recibiendo la, eventualmente la vamos a exportar ya en un formato GeoTIFF con las proyecciones cartográficas que marca INEGI, que es nuestro estándar. Entonces, este, estamos en el proceso ya de generar los productos de los, este, de los rayos como archivos de puntos incluso. ¿Sí? No solamente se va a tener, se va a tener la imagen GeoTIF, pero esos archivos van a eh, generar en donde está el punto del, del rayo, pues está el dato, pero el resto de la imagen, digamos que no tiene datos. Entonces, eso es, fácilmente se puede convertir a un archivo de puntos, que eso es lo que nosotros queremos hacer para que todos nuestros usuarios ya los puedan utilizar en ArcGIS o en cualquier otro sistema. Ahora, el NetCDF directamente, ahorita como lo tenemos, lo tenemos en NetCDF, que no lo, no lo lee directamente ArcGIS, pero sí lo lee Envi. Sí, muchos de, los, de ustedes que, tienen, que, que trabajan con ArcGIS también tienen Envi como un sistema de, de procesamiento de imágenes, entonces en caso de que lo tengan lo pueden leer directamente, ¿sí? Y este, cuando hablemos de distribución de datos, que tenemos una sesión especial, este, les vamos a, ir a decir cómo pueden accesar todo, a todos esos datos que ya estamos poniendo. Sí, 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 sí. Sí, va a ser un, un, este, una base de datos este, de puntos en donde va a tener toda la información como campus en, una, en la geodatabase, por supuesto. Okay, eh, ¿Alguna otra pregunta? Tenemos tiempo, una última pregunta por allá. Voy. Eh, buenas tardes. ¿Qué tan grave es la anomalía térmica del sensor AVI en el GOES 17? So the question was, how serious is the cooling system anomaly in GO-17? And uh, it, it is uh, serious enough that we, we have to put a lot of people and resources on to determine how to maximize the utilization if the problem cannot be solved completely. We've been working hard at resolving it, and uh, people are still working hard on that. If uh, we're not able to resolve it completely, then we're working on how to maximize the information that we have. But the images that we have from the ABI and the channels one, two, and three are nominal and excellent. Uh, we also have all the other instruments on the satellite. So I, I do believe there will be some more information released this week. So once that's released, we'll, we'll pass that on to you. Okay. Um, muchas okay. gracias. Thank you very much. So un aplauso, por favor.
Pues bien, con esto llegamos a la primera mitad de, del taller. A continuación tenemos la comida en la cafetería que está en la facultad de veterinaria, son menos de 100 metros, son 50 metros caminando. En cuanto salimos de aquí del instituto, vuelta a la izquierda y, la, y seguimos el corredor luego, luego a la derecha y derechito ahí a unos cuantos metros se ve la cafetería, entonces si son tan amables de, de formarse para pasar por su boleto de, de alimentos y eh, un obsequio como decía que los amigos de la NOA están trayendo. Gaby, ¿querías?